So some learning outcomes for today's lecture. Um, on the completion of my lecture, you should be able to recall the prevalence of CAM morphology, label tears, cartilage and, and cartilage defects in asymptomatic football players. Recall which hip joint imaging findings are associated with hip and groin pain and demonstrate an understanding about, of the relationship between CAM morphology symptoms and early hip OA. So firstly, I'd just like to provide a really quick um, overview of the prevalence classification and characteristics of hip and groin pain in football players. So we know from a number of studies that hip and groin um, complaints or problems are a really common um, issue in both male and female football players. If we look at the prospective time loss studies, we know that they represent about 18% of all time loss injuries in football players. More contemporary um, definitions um, suggest that if we um, combine both uh, injuries that result in um, with and without time loss, around 50% of football players will have some form of groin complaint during a competition season. So if we put those, um, those figures in context, if we think about a 25-man um, player squad, anywhere from three to eight players will have some form of groin problem on a weekly basis. So we've obviously made great strides in, in the last 10 to 15 years in, in the classification of hip and groin conditions, and that was obviously led primarily through the, the Doha Agreement on, um, on groin pain in athletes, which categorises groin pain into three main categories, so the defined clinical entities, uh, hip-related pain, and those other causes of groin pain, such as rheumatological or other. For the purposes of today, I'm going to be primarily focusing on hip-related pain, and we, um, through the development of the Warwick Agreement, and more recently, the International Hip Pain Research Network statement, we know that hip related pain can be uh, categorised into three main, um, three main categories. So that's FAI syndrome, acetabular dysplasia or hip instability, and those other causes such as labral, chondral and ligamentum teres tears that do not have distinct osseous morphology. So if we look to the characteristics of hip-related pain in football players, we can generally understand um, how prevalent these condition are, conditions are sorry, through prospective cohorts and also cross-sectional studies looking at um, large groups of athletes with uh, long-standing hip and groin pain. And from the available studies, it appears that hip-related pain is not a common form of time loss injury in, in football players, but can be, pre can be prevalent in, in those with long-standing hip and groin complaints. So the next section of my presentation, I want to really outline this rise in interest uh, and also surgical procedures for hip related conditions. So as I highlighted previously, hip related pain can be uh, categorised into three main, um, three main forms, FAI syndrome, acetabular dysplasia or hip instability, and those secondary conditions such as labral, chondral or ligamentum teres tears. It is important to obviously highlight that there are other conditions that can affect the hip joint that aren't mentioned there. We need to obviously be cognizant of those uh, when we see an athlete presenting with uh, hip and groin pain. For the purposes of today's presentation, I'm gonna be primarily focusing on FAI syndrome and labral and chondral conditions. So it was the seminal paper in 2003 um, by Reinhold Gans, a prominent Swiss surgeon that really def um, developed this term femoral acetabular impingement. But it was um, years before um, there were a number of studies that looked at this idea of incongruent hip morphology as a risk factor for early hip OA. But it wasn't until GANS in 2003 that we had this term that we, we often use in clinical and research settings nowadays. So GANS describes two main forms of bony impingement. So on the screen in front of you, you can see a femoral acetabular articulation without any impingement, so a nice spherical femoral head and adequate coverage provided by the acetabulum. CAM impingement, it was the first type described by GANS and obviously the, probably the most commonly um, recognised, and that obviously results when there's an aspherical femoral head, which results in reduced head neck offset and premature contact between this bony protuberance and the acetabular soft tissue structures, primarily within the superolateral joint subregion. Pincer impingement um, results due to um, excessive coverage by the acetabulum, and that can be either focal or global overcoverage. It's important to also mention that we also have a, a third type, um, which is now quite common, um, commonly described in the literature, which is obviously mixed impingement. So a combination of both the CAM and pincer morphology resulting in bony impingement. 
In 2016, uh, Damien Griffin and his colleagues further developed this term, um, ephemeris tabular impingement, to what we now know as FAI syndrome. And they um, defined the condition as a, a triad of symptoms, clinical signs and imaging findings. And essentially you need all three to have a diagnosis of FAI syndrome. When we talk about label conditions, we're talking about things such as label tears uh, or, or complex label maceration. So we know that labrum is a fibrocartilaginous triangle that has a number of different joint uh, functions within the joint that you can see on the screen in front of you there. The etiology is complex but um, can, and, and can consist of joint trauma or joint injury, uh, any sort of laxity to the capsule, and obviously alteration in bony morphology that we see in FAI syndrome uh, and also acetabular dysplasia. Chondral or cartilage conditions uh, are known to be a hallmark feature of the OA continuum. Now we know when uh, cartilage is intact, it's considered to be aneural. As cartilage breaks down, it has a, a role in nociception through secondary um, processes such as release of inflammatory mediators, but also exposure of the subchondral bone, which we know is highly innervated. Again, it has a multifactorial etiology. Um, we know that excessive and under um, underloading of the joint can be detrimental to, to the cartilage uh, quality and composition, but also joint injury and trauma. And obviously, uh, as I mentioned, for labral conditions, this altered bony morphology that we see in FAI syndrome and dysplasia. So since the publication by GANS in 2000, uh, 2003, we've seen over 3,000 um, scientific uh, articles published on FAI syndrome. And this has uh, coincided with an exponential rise in the number of hip, arth hip arthroscopies um, being performed around the world for FAI syndrome and the associated conditions such as label and chondral conditions. And you can see some values there from the United States firstly, but also from the United Kingdom that show this exponential rise in the number of hip arthroscopies um, being performed. If we looked at a recent systematic review by Darren Dessar, it highlights that FAI syndrome and label, label conditions are some of the main reasons that an athlete will, with groin pain may undergo surgery. In a scoping review by Scott Peters, a um, researcher from the United States, um, they um, wanted to analyse the criterion that is commonly used uh, for, um, um, for surgical indications um, for FAI syndrome. And the overarching message from their review was that there's a heavy reliance on imaging findings. So um, close to all studies use some form of imaging criterion for deciding on surgical uh, interventions, with alpha angle being the most common uh, imaging metric. What was a really uh, interesting finding was that only 15% of the studies actually use some form of imaging and a diagnostic injection to confirm the relevance of those imaging findings when deciding on a surgical procedure. And they surmised uh, the issue here is that, that there is a, the primary reliance on um, these imaging measures and a limited um, use of the comprehensive assessment may actually result in inappropriate patient selection. So what I want to provide to you now is, a, is an overview um, of the relationship between these hip joint imaging findings that we commonly um, see in conditions such as FAI syndrome and acetabular dysplasia and it, their relationship with symptoms. So when we think about hip joint imaging findings, we're generally um, thinking about intra-articular conditions such as labral and chondral conditions, but also the associated bony morphology such as CAM morphology and pincer morphology. But firstly, I just want to explore the relationship between these intra-articular conditions and pain. So along with my research team, we undertook a systematic review that was published in um, British Journal of Sports Medicine in 2018 to understand the prevalence of these imaging defined conditions in people with and without pain. So for label findings, we found a, a pool prevalence of 62% in those people reporting hip and groin pain. We saw an equally high prevalence in asymptomatic individuals without a history of hip and groin pain um, in, when, we, when we pulled the available studies. For cartilage conditions, we again saw a really high prevalence of cartilage conditions in individuals with hip and groin pain but a substantially lower prevalence in those asymptomatic individuals in the included studies. Now, on reflection, the individuals we included in our asymptomatic studies were, were um, at a younger age than those in, um, included in the symptomatic studies. And we know that age is associated with the, um, both the prevalence and severity of cartilage 
um, deterioration. So that may have some role to play in the discrepancies here. And when I present, um, present some of the findings from my PhD, um, it shows that when you match individuals by age and sex and um, level of activity, we actually see a very similar prevalence of cartilage findings in those with and without pain. For those other joint fe um, features that we often see in imaging reports, we saw an overall trend for a high prevalence in uh, individuals with hip and groin pain, but we were unable to pull any of the, um, the available studies um, due to the heterogeneity of the, of the, of the included um, studies and populations. After the completion of that review, we really wanted to, um, to further our understanding, in particular this time in athletes. So we undertook a second systematic review looking at the prevalence of these imaging defined conditions in athletes, in active athletes with hip and groin pain and compared them to those without any symptoms. And this was um, published in Sports Medicine 219. If we look at labelled tears and pain, we only um, found one study um, reporting labelled tears at a per person level, and they, they identified around 22% of the individuals with hip and groin pain um, presenting to a sports medicine clinic um, had labelled tears on MRA or MRI with contrast. Again, we saw a, a, a really high prevalence of, um, of label, label findings on MRI in asymptomatic athletes. But again, we can't directly compare those, uh, those two values given the, um, the lack of studies in, in the symptomatic athletes. We were also interested in finding out whether um, uh, the type of mechanical load that was um, that is placed on the hip joint by a given sport influences the prevalence of label findings and, and then further their association with symptoms. So you can see here we used a, um, a, an approach which is commonly used in the hip arthroscopy literature that divides sports into cutting, flexibility, contact, impingement, asymmetrical and endurance based sports. So what we found again was a high prevalence, um, a moderate to high prevalence of labelled tears in asymptomatic athletes from both from cutting, contact and impingement sports. But what was a, almost an alarming finding is we have failed to identify uh, any studies that reported um, the prevalence of label um, tears in symptomatic athletes from these three sports. So a huge gap in the literature. For chondral findings or cartilage defects, we found a range of prevalences, and again, as I mentioned before in my um, in my earlier slides, when we looked at when we look at um, individuals of the same age and um, participating in the same level of activity, it appears that these cartilage findings may actually be equally prevalent in those people with and without symptoms. Again, for select features, we saw a trend of a higher prevalence in uh, individual in active athletes with hip and groin pain compared to those without. But again, we were unable to pull these studies and, we, and in, in essentially we, we need to know more about these secondary features. So the take home for you today um, from those two systematic reviews uh, are that label tears are found in a high percentage of people um, without pain. So up to one in two athletes with higher values um, in specific sports. Cartilage defects are present in both people with and without pain. From our first review, it, it showed there was a higher prevalence in symptomatic individuals compared to those without pain, but that wasn't present in, in our in the study of athletes. And in generally, in, in general, sorry, these other conditions uh, appear to have um, to be in a, a high percentage of people with pain, but we needed to we need to know more about these secondary joint features. What was an alarming and um, con uh, concerning finding was that we identified only five studies which included 58 hips in athletes with hip and groin pain and none in cutting contact or impingement sports. If we cast our attention back to the study by Darren Dessar, they identified that label pathology is one of the main reasons that a, um, a, an athlete from a, a sport such as ice hockey, which would be an impingement based sport, um, would undergo surgery. But we, uh, if you look at the literature, we, we know very little about the relevance of these imaging findings in symptomatic athletes. By comparison, if we look to the literature um, of the low back or the shoulder, they, they include really a large number of participants uh, in, in their, in their, uh, their meta-analysis and systematic reviews that looking at the relationship of these imaging findings. So we are a long way behind um, when it comes to the hip joint. So in light of this gap in the literature, um, one of the main studies of my PhD was to look at the prevalence of these, uh, what we class as early hip OA features on MRI uh, in football players. Um, and I was lucky to be part of uh, the femoral acetabular impingement and hip OA cohort study, which is based here at La Trobe University. 
And this, uh, the, this uh, paper was recently published in, um, in osteoarthritis and cartilage. So I just would like to provide you with a, um, a, a brief overview of the four studies so you understand um, the aims of our study and, and what we're trying to um, look for. So the primary outcomes of the four study are to look at changes in patient reported outcome measures and also hip joint structure on MRI over time. We're concerned with three main um, predictive variables, so bony morphology, uh, hip joint biomechanics, and muscle function. So at baseline, we collected 182 football players, so that's soccer and Australian football players that are performing at a sub-elite competition level. Um, they could be either male or female, um, but they all had greater than six months of, of hip and groin pain and a positive um, uh, for deer test in at least one hip joint. To sit us alongside those symptomatic football players, we recruited a um, control group of, again, um, soccer or Australian football players performing at a sub-elite competition level um, without a history of hip and groin pain. And all of those control participants had a negative for deer test in both hips. So the data I'm presenting to you today comes from our baseline examination. Um, we've, we're just about to complete our two-year MRI follow-up, um, and we've just commenced our five-year MRI follow-up. So this is a really quick um, breakdown of our, our cohort. So the symptomatic football players had a median age of 26 years. Uh, there was about 20% of those were, uh, were women. All of them had a positive for deer and, and um, all of the participants were free of radiographic hip LA. And you can see that we matched our control participants to our symptomatic um, football players. So if we, we, we actually break, um, broke our, our, um, our symptomatic football players into um, those with symptomatic hips and those with an asymptomatic hip. So we had 288 hips that, um, that had self-reported hip and groin pain and a positive for deer test. In 74 of our football players with hip and groin pain, they had a contralateral asymptomatic hip, which is represented by the other hip there. And we classified, sorry, that is the other hip. For our control group, all of them had, a, um, had no history of hip and groin pain and a negative for deer test, and we had 110 hips in our control group. So we, we used the scoring of hip OA with MRI, um, semi-quantitative MRI assessment tool that evaluates eight different OA features that you can see on the screen in front of you. For select features, they are analysed in um, 10 different anatomical subregions, so four within the acetabulum and six on the femoral, um, femoral head. It enabled us to determine both the prevalence of these OA features, but also the severity and extent of select features. So for cartilage, bone marrow, edema, subchondral cyst, labral um, tears, and, and the whole joint or the total Shomri score. So you can see the 10 subregions here on the schematic on the screen. So four on the acetabulum and uh, six on the femoral head. And here you can see some really lovely artwork from Vicky Earle, who's a, um, a fantastic uh, artist from, uh, from um, Canada. So on the sagittal uh, MRI sequences, we analysed the anterior and posterior uh, joint regions. On the coronal images, we, we can look at the lateral, supralateral, supramedial and inferior joint regions. And you can see here that we, could all, we can look at um, the femoral and acetabular uh, um, uh, regions on, on, on those different subregions. So what I'd like to present to you now is the prevalence of these eight uh, intra-articular features. I just would like to um, make reference that um, I haven't included the prevalence of intra-articular loose bodies because we, we, um, we found that in very few of our football players um, across the three groups. So you can see on the screen, we have our symptomatic hips, our other hips or the, the um, asymptomatic, um, the contralateral hip in our football players with um, unilateral pain and the control football players without any history of hip and groin pain, and the eight different OA features on the, on the, um, uh, across the, um, the bottom of your screen there. So we found that around one in two football players, regardless of, of symptoms, had some form of cartilage defect on MRI. So that's either a partial or a full thickness defect. When we looked at the prevalence of, uh, of full thickness defects, we saw a considerably higher prevalence in our symptomatic football players and other hips compared to the control hip. Control hip, sorry. For the subchondral features, we generally saw a low prevalence, uh, and that makes sense given that all of our football players were without any radiographic hip OA. Um, and we know that these, these features are particularly more prevalent as the radiographic disease becomes more severe 
we saw a really high prevalence of labelled tears across the three groups, um, and this sort of fits with the messages from our, our, our two systematic reviews that shows that there are, that labelled tears are, are very, very common uh, in um, asymptomatic athletes. We found a low prevalence of um, ligamentum teres tears and a moderate to high prevalence of um, a moderate prevalence of um, of paralabel cysts across the three groups. Uh, interesting finding was uh, actually a significantly higher prevalence of effusion synovitis in our control football players. Now, I just want um, to um, to highlight a couple of things about the the way that this was assessed on the Shomri. So we used a present or absent definition, so we weren't able to determine whether the severity or extent of this uh, imaging feature is at all associated with symptoms. And we know with um, without using a with using a non-contrast MRI, which is what we um, use for all of our participants, that we're unable to um, to delineate between effusion and synovitis. So we provide a composite, um, effectively a composite measure. So there's obviously limitations with that approach. It's also important to highlight that this is um, cross-sectional data. We um, we need our longitudinal follow-up to understand whether. Firstly, whether control football players with these features are more susceptible to developing symptoms over time. And conversely, in our symptomatic football players, we need to understand whether um, these features are associated with both symptomatic and functional decline. So there's a lot more work that needs to be done there. If we look at um, the, the feature scores, which provides us with a measure of severity or extent of um, intra-articular um, intra conditions, Firstly, the Shomri score, which is a measure of whole joint disease. So it, it combines all of the eight features and their respective um, subregions. We found a significantly higher uh, Shomri score in our, our football players with hip and groin pain. We failed to observe any difference in our cartilage score, but when we um, subgrouped um, based on sex, we found a relationship between uh, cartilage score and symptoms in our male football players. We found a significantly higher um, uh, label score in our symptomatic football players. We then compared these feature scores to um, patient report outcome measures that are commonly used in studies of football players, and we found no relationship between the severity of these OA features and hip and groin patient outcome measures. So the take home of this study is that um, in football players, there is a high prevalence of these early hip OA features in those with and without pain. But we obviously need longitudinal studies to understand the implications of these OA features. There is some association between the severity of these features and the presence of hip and groin pain, but we, we were unable to find any relationship with hip and groin specific patient outcome measures. Essentially, most of these hip joint imaging findings do not appear to enable us to discriminate football players with um, hip and groin pain from those without pain, at least at a group level. So what about the relationship between bony hip morphology and pain? So um, when we talk about bony morphology, I'm gonna be primarily addressing CAM and pincer morphology in today's lecture. So there've been a number of systematic reviews that you can see on the screen in front of you that have, um, that have reported the prevalence of, of these two types, two forms of bony morphology uh, in a range of um, individuals um, from athletes to those people with and without symptoms. So uh, in studies of NFL players, golfers, um, Brazilian martial artists and youth football players, there is an association between CAM morphology and pain. In, in a, a recent study in ballet dancers, they failed to find any relationship. It's from, the, from the available studies, there appears to be no re, um, relationship between the presence of pincer morphology and hip and groin pain. But I just want to highlight that, um, and this is a quote um, that comes from a a review uh, that I was very lucky to be part of with um, a, a close colleague and friend, Pim Van Clay, um, that many of the studies that report this association are, are generally at high risk of bias. And so we should be really careful when, um, when interpreting the, this relationship between bony morphology and symptoms, in particular in athletes. So one of the, the, um, the other key um, studies from my PhD was to explore this relationship in our uh, football players that were included in the FORCE cohort. And this was, um, study was recently published in the um, JOSPT uh, earlier this year. So when we looked at the prevalence of bony hip morphology um, or cam morphology um, in particular, we failed to find any, any uh, significant difference in the prevalence of cam morphology using an alpha angle cutoff of 60 degrees and also large cam morphology. And the same could be said to pin, um, for pincer morphology and acetabular dysplasia. 
But it's important to um, to highlight for both of these um, acetabular morphologies that we only use the lateral, lateral centre edge angle to define the presence of the conditions. And we know there are other, other imaging metrics that we can use to define the presence of, of both um, pincer morphology um, and acetabular dysplasia. So we just need to take that into account when interpreting those findings. If we look at the size of bony morphology, we failed to find any, uh, any difference in the, um, the size of alpha angle either on the AP pelvis radiographs or the done 45 degree radiographs. And the same could be said for the lateral centre edge angle um, in our football players. We also explored this, the relationship between the size of bony morphology and patient outcome measures in our football players. And again, failed to find any relationship between the size of bony morphology and patient outcome measures. But we need to consider some limitations in our methodology. So obviously radiographic um, assessment provides us with a two-dimensional appreciation of bony morphology. We know that three-dimensional techniques such as MRI and CT can provide a, 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 a more comprehensive assessment of, in particular, um, CAM morphology. And you can, you can see on the screen in front of you um, a, a radial slice um, uh, clock face uh, met, um, uh, image which shows that um, that, uh, that you can assess CAM morphology at a number of different imaging planes that we cannot um, um, do with um, radiographic techniques. Another major limitation with, with, with our study and, and most of the available studies is, is that we consider bony morphology in isolation. So we look at the relationship between CAM morphology and patient outcome, outcome measures, sorry, and pincer morphology and patient outcome measures. When, it, when in, in um, Essentially, we know that there's, there's this um, dynamic interaction between the femur and acetabulum that occurs in, in conditions such as FAI syndrome and acetabular dysplasia. So are we actually capture, capturing this interaction when we use um, uh, approaches such as those? So the take home is that um, both CAM and pincer morphology are common in athletes with and without hip and groin pain. Um, that we, but we obviously need longitudinal studies to understand if these, um, these um, different bony, bony morphological variations are associated with um, the symptom genesis in our control football players, but also deterioration of joint structure and symptoms in our symptomatic football players. It's unlikely to be the sole factor related to development and or severity of symptoms, but we need to remember that it is a risk factor for hip OA. And that brings me really nicely uh, to the next section of my presentation, which is going to explore this relationship between CAM morphology, early OA and symptoms. So we know from um, some studies of, of young adolescent athletes that CAM morphology, that those with CAM morphology are at greater risk of structural progression. And there's, but there's only been one available study that I'm aware of that has, um, that has tracked a group of um, asymptomatic athletes over a, um, a, 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 a five-year study period, uh, looked at both MRI changes at the start and MRI changes at the at the five-year study period. But what was it? What's um, some some recent cross-sectional um, data coming out of the Southampton cohort, which I know many of you will be familiar with? Um, they've done some great work in the development of CAM morphology. They actually they found no association between uh, CAM morphology and the composition of cartilage in their adolescence that they included in, in their cohort. So their um, proposal was that this relationship between CAM morphology and structural changes may actually not start um, not may actually not occur until after skeletal maturation. But again, we need the longitudinal um, uh, aspect of that study to confirm those findings. But that um, raises the question, so why, why do some individuals with CAM morphology and these early OA changes actually become symptomatic? One of the proposed theories is, is that it's the location or severity of structural damage in an individual with CAM morphology and, and early OA that is the driver of symptoms. So I'm, I'm going to present to you a, a study which is currently under review um, and made up the fifth study of my PhD. So I'd, just, I'd appreciate if none of these findings are shared on social media. So what we, what we firstly did in this study is look at the relationship between CAM morphology and chondral conditions in both our symptomatic football players and our control football players. So on the screen in front of you, you can see a coronal MRI with the, um, which has the Shomri subregion superimposed uh, onto it in the white. Below that, you can see a schematic of the Shomri subregions, so the lateral, supralateral, supramedial and inferior subregions.
and below that you can see a prevalence bar chart which essentially as, as the prevalence increases the color changes from green to red and that will make more sense as I present my results. And for the purpose of today we're going to be primarily focusing on the superior lateral subregion which is where we um, think that most of the bony uh, impingement occurs in those with CAM morphology and is definitely the site of most uh, structural changes on MRI. So on the screen in front of you, you can see um, uh, the, the results from our symptomatic football players. So what, what, we, what we did is divide our football players into those without CAM morphology, those with CAM morphology, and those with large CAM morphology. And you can see that each of those subregions are represented in different shades of green or yellow, which represents the prevalence of cartilage defects in the respective subregions. But if we concentrate on the superolateral subregion, you can see that there is an exponential increase in the prevalence of cartilage defects as the CAM morphology size increases. If we, if we consider our asymptomatic football players, again using the three subgroupings, we see the, the same exponential increase and in some situations a high prevalence of cartilage defects in our asymptomatic football players with CAM morphology especially in those superlateral subregions. We also explored the relationship between CAM morphology and label conditions. Again, here you can see a schematic of the different subregions that we um, evaluate um, for the label tears, and the, the prevalence bar chart is the same as the previous slides. And for the, focus, uh, the purpose of today, I'm going to particularly focus on the superior subregion. So again, you can see our symptomatic football players broken into the three groups. And again, we see this exponential increase in the prevalence of um, labelled tears as the CAM morphology size increases. And we see the same pattern in our asymptomatic football players. So what this cross-sectional data tells us is that um, even in the presence of CAM morphology and uh, these early OA changes, the pattern or distribution of, um, of both chondral and label conditions appears almost identical in football players with and without uh, hip and groin pain. But again, we need to follow our football players over, over um, the two and five year period to understand the relevance of these findings. So the take home is that CAM morphology is a risk factor for hip OA. Um, and we know that in both the early stages of disease and end stage uh, hip OA. But it's important to also remember that not all people with CAM morphology will develop hip OA. And if we take um, some of the data from um, Rinch Agricola's um, uh, Czech cohort, even with really large CAM morphology and reduced internal rotation, only half of the hips with, uh, with both of those findings actually developed end-stage hip OA during their five-year study follow-up. And our preliminary work from the FORCE cohort suggests that this, um, the presence of CAM morphology in early OA, um, is, there is still this comp complex relationship between the, the gen generation of symptoms. And again, we need to know more from our longitudinal follow-up to understand uh, the implications of, of, of having CAM morphology and these early OA features. So the question is then, um, then it brings us to the question of, are we actually being hypnotised by imaging findings? So what I do not want you to leave this lecture um, thinking is that all imaging findings are benign. As I mentioned in my previous slides, we know that CAM morphology is a risk factor for OA. And there are specific MRI features um, that are associated with unfavourable surgical outcomes. So we need to be aware of what these features are and communicate uh, th those to our patients and our wider sports medicine team when making treatment decisions. Obviously imaging should fall, form one part of a really comprehensive assessment and we need to um, interpret imaging findings based on the individual's injury history, their characteristics in particular, age, sex and activity related changes, uh, their clinical examination findings and their wider physiological, psychological and, 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 and so, social influences. And it's important to remember that imaging findings that are, are present in someone with the appropriate symptoms and clinical signs may still be relevant and influence our treatment decisions. If you look at the findings from our force co cohort, however, at a group level, these imaging findings um, um, potentially do not enable us to discriminate football players with um, hip and groin pain from those without our, um, pain. And you can see here uh, the prevalence of bony hip morphology and these early OA features and the, the pattern or distribution of, um, of um, uh, imaging findings is almost identical. So what can we do as clinicians? So we need to be aware of the, the imaging findings that are associated with unfavorable outcomes 
um, and communicate them to our patients um, and um, the wider um, uh, treatment team. We also need to consider how we communicate imaging findings. So this, um, this excerpt comes from a qualitative uh, a paper that was uh, published in British Journal of Sports Medicine that investigated um, how patients interpret, interpret um, medical information, um, in particular those seeking um, care of, um, um, with orthopedic surgeons for the treatment of um, uh, intra-articular hip conditions. So you can see by, um, by, that, uh, by that quote, if we fail to give um, accurate and um, sensible information to our patients, then it can really leave them um, uh, um, struggling to, to make sense of, of, of the imaging findings and will essentially influence their treatment decisions. So I'm sure many of you will be aware of um, a really nice editorial that Kieran O'Sullivan published um, some years ago now um, that looked at using this clear principle when um, communicating imaging findings of the hip joint. So we need to use consistent language epidemiological information when available, and the assessment of relevance, um, in particular to our individual, the patient that's sitting in front of us um, uh, in, in our assessment. Um, and I encourage you to, to read that editorial if you, if you haven't uh, already. So the, the findings of my PhD and, and the research that I presented to you today cannot um, obviously happen without an amazing um, team of researchers and, and, and colleagues from both um, here at uh, La Trobe University, but uh, in, in a number of different universities from around the world. And you can see some of those um, amazing people on the screen in front of you. 